Bible had been rumours that the British sought to destroy the religions of the Indian people and force the native soldier to break their sacred code would certainly add it to the rumour, as it apparently did. The company were quick to reverse the effects of this policy in the hope that the Indians would be quelled. On the 27th of January, Colonel Richard Birch, the military secretary, ordered that all cartridges issued from the depots were to be free from grease and that the sepoys could grease them themselves using whatever mixture, quote, they may prefer, unquote. A modification was also made to the drill for the loading of that cartridge so that it was torn with the hands and not bitten. This, however, merely caused many to sort of suppose and to be convinced that the rumours were true and their fears were justified. Additional rumours started with the paper in the new cartridges, which was glazed and stiffened, and the previous used paper were impregnated with grease. Though the British made the attempt to reverse what had been done, the Indians were convinced the British no longer had no other desire than to destroy their way of life. The civilian rebellion was more multivarious in origin. The rebellion consisted of three groups, the feudal nobility, rural landowners called Talguitars and the peasants, the, the mobility, many of whom lost titles and domains under the doctrine of lapse, which refused to recognise the adopted children or princesses or princesses of legal heirs felt that the company had interfered with a traditional system of inheritance. Rebel leaders such as Nana Sahab and the Rani of Jonanasi belonged to the group. The latter, for example, was prepared to accept East Indian Company supremacy if her adopted son was recognised as her late husband's heir. In other areas of central India, such as Indonor and Sagar, where such loss of privilege had not occurred yet, the prince remained loyal to the company even in areas where the sepoys had rebelled. The second group, the Talakadars, had lost half their landed estate to peasant farmers as a result of the land reforms that came in the wake of annexation of Uda. The rebellion grain ground the Talakus quickly reoccupied the lands they had lost and paradoxically in part of the ties of kinship and federal loyalty did not experience significant opposition from the peasant farmers, many of whom joined the rebellion to the great dismay of the British. It was also suggested that heavy land revenue assessments in some areas by the British resulted in many landowner families either losing their land or going into great debt with money lenders and providing ultimately a reason to rebel. Money lenders, in addition to the company, were particularly objective to the rebels' animosity. The civilian rebellion was highly uneven in its geographic distribution. Even in areas of north central India, there was no longer under British control. For example, the relative prosperous Muzaffanaga district, a beneficiary of company irrigation scheme, and next door to Muret, where the upheaval began, stayed mostly calm throughout. Much of the resistance to the company came from the old aristocracy who were seeing their power steadily eroded. The company had annexed several states under the doctrine of lapse, according to which land belonging to the federal ruler began the property of the East Indian Company if on his death the ruler did not leave a male heir through natural process. Long been the custom for the childless landowner owner to adopt an heir, but the East Indian Company ignored this tradition. The ability feudal landholders and the royal armies found that these unemployed and humiliated, humiliated due to company expansionism. Even the jewels of the royal family of Nagpur were publicly auctioned in Calcutta, a move that was seen as a sign of abject disrespect by the remnants of the Indian aristocracy. Lord Dalhousie, the Governor General of India, had asked the Mughal Emperor Bagdubar Shah Zafar and its successor to leave the Red Fort, the palace in Delhi. 
Later, Lord Canning, the next Governor General of India, announced in 1856 that Bharat Shah's successor would not even be allowed to use the title of King. Such discourtesies were resented by the deposed Indian rulers. Unitarian and evangelical inspired social reform, including the abolition of seti and legalisation of widow remarriage, were considered by many, especially the British themselves, to have caused suspicion that Indian religious traditions were being interfered with, with the ultimate aim of conversion. Recent historians, including Chris Bailey, have preferred to frame this as a clash of knowledges, with proclamations from religious authorities before the result and testimony after it, including such issues as the insults of women, the rise of low persons and the British tutelage, and the population caused by Western medicine and prosecuting and ignoring of traditional astrological authorities. European run schools were also a problem. According to recorded testimonies, anger had spread because of stories that mathematics was replaced in religious instruction. Stories were chosen that would bring contempt upon Indian religions and because your children were exposed to moral dangers by education. The justice system was considered to be inherently unfair to the Indians. The official blue books, East Indian Torture, 1855 to 1857 laid before the House of Commons during the sessions of 1856 and 57, which revealed the company officers were allowed to extend their series of appeals if convicted or accused of brutally or crimes against Indians. It was also revealed that the officers had freedom to collect revenue via extortion in many cases. The economic policies of the East Indian Company were also resented by many Indians. Each of the three presidencies into which the East Indian Company divided India for administration purposes maintained their own armies. Of these armies, the Bengal Presidency was the largest. Unlike the other two, it recruited, recruited heavily from among high caste Hindus and comparatively wealthy Muslims. The Muslim formed a larger percentage of the irregular units within the Bengal army whilst Hindus were mainly to be found in the regular units. The sepoys the native Indian soldiers were therefore affected to a large degree by con the concerns of land holding and traditional members of the Indian society. In the early years of the company rule, they tolerated and even encouraged the caste privileges and customs within the Bengal army, which recruited its regular soldiers almost exclusively, exclusively amongst the landowning Burihir, uh, Burihams and the Rajputs of the Ganges Valley. By the time the customs and privileges came to be threatened by modern, modernising regimes in Calcutta from the 1840s onwards, the sepoys had become accustomed to very high ritual status and were extremely sensitive to suggestions that their caste might be polluted. Sepoys also gradually became dissatisfied with the various other aspects of army life. Their pay was relatively low and after Adwa and the Punjab were annexed, the soldiers no longer received extra pay, batter or blatter, for their services there because they were no longer considered foreign missions. The junior European soldiers and officers were increasingly estranged from their soldiers, in many cases threatening them as their racial inferiors. Officers of evangelical persuasion and of the company's army, such as Herbert Edwards and Colonel S.G. Weller of the 34th Bengal Infantry, are taken to preaching to their sepoys in the hope of converting them to Christianity. In 1856, a new enlistment act was introduced by the company, which in theory made every unit in the Bengal army liable to service overseas although it only intended to apply to new recruits. The sepoys feared that the act might be applied retrospectively to them as well. It was argued that the high caste Hindus who travelled in the cramped squalid conditions of the troop ship would find it impossible to avoid losing caste through ritual pollution. 
Several months of increasing tensions coupled with various incidents preceded the actual rebellion. On the 26th of February 1857, the 19th Bengal Native Army Regiment became concerned that new cartridges they had been issued with were wrapped in paper grease with cow and pig fat, which had to be opened by mouth, thus affecting their religious sensibilities. Their colonel confronted them, supported by, it, by artillery and cavalry on the parade ground, but after some negotiation, withdrew the artillery and council next morning for parade. On the 29th of March, 1857, at the Barakpur Nabarakspur parade ground near Calcutta, now Karachi, 29-year-old Mengor Padli of the 34th Bengal Native Infantry, angered by the recent actions of the East Indian Company, declared that he would rebel against his commanders. Informed about Pendley's apparently drug induced behaviour, Sergeant Major James Hewson went to investigate, only to have Pendley shoot at him. Henson raised the alarm. When his adjacent Lieutenant Henry Bow came out to investigate the arrest, Paddy opened fire but hit. Ben Hur's horse instead. General John, Hurst, General John Hersey came out to see him on the parade ground and claimed later that Mangal Pandey was some kind of religious frenzy. He ordered the Indian commander of the quarter guard, Jamadi Ishwari Prasad, to arrest the Pangal Pandey, but the Bendo but the Jamanda refused. The quartermaster guarded at the other supos present, with the single exception of a soldier called Shika Palutu, drew back from their restraint and arrested Mengel Penley. Sheik Palutu restrained Pengli from continuing his attack. After failing to incite his comrades into open and active rebellion, Mangal Pandey tried to take his own life by placing his musket to his chest and pulling the trigger with his toe. He only managed to wound himself and he was court-martialed on the 6th of April. He was hanged on the 8th. The Jahamadi Bishari Prashad was sentenced to death and hanged on the 22nd of April. The regiment was disbanded and stripped of their uniforms because it was felt they harboured ill feelings towards their superiors, particularly after this incident. Shakyar Palutu was promoted to rank her Jamada in the Bengal army. Sepoys and other regiments throughout this thought this was a very harsh punishment. To show a disgrace while dis- disbanding could have contributed to the extent of the rebellion in view of some historians as dis- disgruntled ex sepoys returned home to Awada with a desire to inflict revenge and, and when the opportunity arose. During April, there was unrest and fires at Agra, Al-Haladbab and Abala. At Abala in particular, with a large military contentment with several units had been collected for their annual musketry practice. It was clear to General Anderson, Commander-in-Chief of the Bengal Army, that some sort of riot over the cartridges were imminent. Despite the obligations of the civilian Jubilee General Staff, he agreed to postpone the military practice and allow a new drill by which the soldiers tore the cartridges through their fingers rather than their teeth. However, he issued no general orders making this standard practice throughout the Bengal army, and rather than remain at Ambala to defuse overall or overall potential trouble, he then proceeded to Simla, the cool hill station where many high officials spent the summer. Although there was no open revolt at Ambala, there was widespread arson during late April. Barrack buildings, especially those belonging to soldiers who used the Enfield cartridges and European officers' bungalows were set on fire. At Moret, there was another large military canapment where 2,357 Indian sepoys and 2,038 British soldiers were stationed with 12 British man guns. The station held one of the largest concentrations of British troops in India and was later to be cited as evidence the original uprising was spontaneous rather than a pre-planned plot. Although the general state of unrest within the 
Ben Gutt Army was Westworld, no. On the 24th of April, 